Oh, they're coming. They All right. Coming. I think everyone is uh, getting in here. Um, I'm going to sit in for two seconds for Graham, who is uh, shuttling his child back from basketball practice um, and probably going to be joining here in the next few minutes. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started with our program. Um, and we'll get uh, Graham in on the flip side. Uh, with that, uh, go ahead, Rachel, and uh, introduce our guest speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the 34th pre-meeting program, our first one of 2024. Welcome back and Happy New Year to all of you. Um, we have a very special guest this evening for our program from uh, the Seattle City of Seattle's Care Department, and I'm going to uh, let him tell you all about what that what C A R E stands for and just the whole thing. Um, so Devante Bell is our guest of honor today. Devante has been with the Care Department since January of 2020, uh, where he started as a lateral dispatcher. Um, prior to moving to Seattle, he worked as a 911 dispatcher in Charlotte, North Carolina, where he dispatched for three years. Uh, so he's very familiar with the 911 system and how it works. And you can ask questions at the end of the program about anything to do with that um, if, if you have interest there. Uh, since being with the department, uh, Devante has worked as a 911 floor supervisor, managing call takers and dispatchers. Also, uh, the former president of the Seattle Dispatchers Guild. Uh, and Devante also served in that role for two and a half years prior to transitioning to the current role where he is now. Uh, this, uh, his current role is the strategic advisor for 911 community engagement. And uh, he has been in this role since November of 2023. Everybody, please raise up your hands and let's give a nice warm 34th LD Dems. Welcome to Devante Bell. Devante, it's all yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you, everybody, for having me here. Um, it's an honor. Um, I enjoy speaking to the community, speaking to community members and getting the message out about the care department. Um, just a little bit more about myself um, before I get into the presentation. Um, I do have my bachelor's in political science. Uh, I went to university at uh, University of North Carolina, Charlotte, um, before deciding to up and just move to Seattle um, for no specific reason, um, just like the weather and figured why not move across the country away from, you know, all my family that's on the East Coast. Um, so yeah, my current role, um, as Rachel mentioned, is, to, is community engagement. So a lot of this is going to community meetings, um, spreading the message about the new care team, about the new crisis responders, um, and about 911 in general, um, and educating the public about 911. Um, Seattle has never been great about educating the public about 911, um, and so that's what I'm here for. Um, but I'm going to jump into the presentation. Um, I will say if you have any questions, feel free to uh, cut me off and ask the question. Uh, oh. Actually, Devante, I'm sorry to interrupt, oh. but if folks, if you if you have questions, I would like that if we can just have De Devante allow him to get through his whole um, presentation because he may answer a question that you have from by, by the end of the program. So let let's let him go all the way through. Please write down your question, or you could even put it in the chat. And uh, we'll do all questions at the end, and we will have at least 15, <laughs> maybe 20 minutes for questions. So we'll have a nice leisurely time to uh, to do question and answer. So Devante, okay. please uh, awesome. unfettered do your uh, <laughs> presentation. Yes. So um, hopefully you all should be able to see my screen. Um, let me know if there are any issues there. Um, but the Seattle Care Department um, is the newest public safety department within the city of Seattle. Um, it was one of Bruce Harrell's uh, major initiatives that he wanted to push, uh, major campaign promises. Um, it stands for Community Assisted Response and Engagement. Um, the idea for the care department um, is to be a larger depart department encompassing multiple different divisions. So right now you have the 911 center and the care crisis responders um, eventually will have more under our umbrella. Um, it officially launched October 25th, 2023. 
Um, and that's also when the new crisis responders kind of got out on the street a week before that um, to respond to um, a few calls with police. Uh, so the mission of the CARE uh, department uh, is to improve uh, community safety by unifying and aligning the city's community focused public safety investments and services to address low risk calls for behavioral health matters through diversified responses that are evidence-based, effective, innovative, and compassionate. Um, I will say one um, good thing that I think the administration has done is uh, they identified Chief Amy Smith to lead this department. Um, she has her um, you know, master's in social work. Um, this is what she has done for years um, and working in different areas. Um, so she really under understands this field of work. Um, and she's put people in place that understand this, uh, you know, this level of work. Our uh, manager for the care team, uh, Catriona Hernandez, she's a former 911 supervisor as well and also um, has her master's in social work. Um, and she used to work um, in transitional housing. Um, and so she understands both sides of it um, with 911 and the uh, care side of things, as we call it, um, with the social work um, stuff. So um, they've done a great job with hiring Amy um, because she is uh, very focused on kind of unifying every city department um, that we, uh, you know, engage with, um, and also getting a lot of the services that are uh, duplicated throughout the city um, to kind of come under one roof. So we're not duplicating efforts across the city for no reason. Um, so as I mentioned, um, right now we have three de uh, department divisions, um, technically two, but eventually it will be three. Um, so the Seattle 911 Center, the care team community crisis response, uh, responders, excuse me, and then the community violence intervention. That hasn't come yet, um, but the mayor is planning on moving violence intervention under our department. Um, as far as the Seattle 911 Center, um, we have been our own department since uh, it was June of 2021 uh, when the former council pulled us out of uh, Seattle Police Department's budget. Um, at that time, we were the Community Safety and Communication Center. Um, and then over the past year is when we transitioned to the new care department um, and started building this larger overall department. So the Seattle 911 Center is the largest um, public safety answering point or PSAP in Washington. Um, we answer 900 plus thousand calls a year. Um, and we are the first first responders. Um, I say we because I used to work in there and I will always identify as a 911 uh, dispatcher. Um, but the call takers and dispatchers currently on the federal level, um, they are classified as clerical workers, um, which annoys a lot of us um, because we are not clerical. Um, not just anyone can come in and be a 911 call taker or dispatcher. Um, it takes a special uh, person to handle that job. Um, but we're the public safety data hub and control center for emergency responses. Um, and we coordinate with our regional and national partners um, to be innovative. Um, so we're the main answering point. Um, so anytime anybody calls 911, if you ever had experience, you'll know you get Seattle 911 first. Um, and then if you need fire or medics, we have to transfer you to fire um, and medics. So they're the secondary PSAP within the Seattle region. Um, that's typically in most places you'll have police, fire, and medics consolidated into one 911 center. Um, but currently in Seattle, that's not the case. Uh, maybe one day that may change. So we deal with um, primary response um, as with police. So any obvious emergency um, demanding immediate, immediate uh, action. Um, also secondary response. Um, those are usually like our non-emergency calls. Um, it can typically be a person that needs help, welfare check, um, but a lot of it can be follow-ups report type calls. Um, and then adding the diversified response with the care team, um, that's where we're adding the dual dispatch. Um, so that's where, you know, a 911 call taker will get a call, um, say they identify a call as a person down or a welfare check um, right now in the downtown core. Once that gets sent to the dispatcher um, for West Precinct, um, they will get the call, they'll read the notes, the narrative of the call, and determine, oh, this is a call where I can send police and also send the care team. So they'll dispatch uh, 
two officers generally, and then also the care team um, to hopefully arrive at the same time. Typically officers will get there just to make sure that the scene is safe and secure. Um, if they don't need to make any enforcement action, then we have the care responders uh, come in. They'll talk with the officers, the officers hand it over, um, and they'll do what they have to do there. Um, we want our 911 center to be, again, the main data hub, to be data-driven and decision-making processes um, to help with the, uh, inform our policies and practices. Um, that's the one thing that uh, Chief Smith is pushing is to have 911 inform us going forward um, with where the concerns lie with public safety um, and how we can better the diversify response. Um, and really the big message um, that we're really leaning on is the message that uh, Mayor Harrell is pushing of One Seattle. Um, so making sure that public safety um, stands behind that as we're all working together, SPD, SFD, and the uh, care department. Um, and we're really pushing that message out with a lot of media and videos that we're doing, showing how uh, SFD, SPD, and the care department all interface with each other. Um, because you might have times where police, fire, and the care responders are responding to the same call. Um, fire determined that it was no longer a medical need. Um, so police asked for the care responders to come there um, and the care responders you know, offer their assistance um, that's needed. Um, so this is just a uh, craft. Amy loves uh, Venn diagrams. Um, she likes to just show kind of how we interface with each other. Um, you have care in the middle dealing with the low acuity calls. Um, one thing I like to mention to everybody, because I think it was something that people were hung up on um, when this all came about, is that people were very focused on oh, what are the priority three calls? What is a priority three down person? So on and so forth, so on and so forth. The priority type does not matter. I mean, we can have a priority one down person that police responds to, and they ultimately get out there and say, hey, we can have the care responders come out here and do their job. You know, same with a priority two call. Um, and that has been happening where officers are getting out on priority one or priority two calls, and they ultimately determine this is not something for police. So we can ask the care responders to respond. The only thing it changes for the dispatchers is that dispatchers will not dispatch the care team um, immediately for a priority one or priority two call um, unless the officer asks them to. Um, now, if it's a priority three call, then we can dual dispatch. But as of right now, we won't dual dispatch for priority one and priority two. Um, but I just don't want people to get hung up on the priority codes um, because if people were to look into it, we don't have a lot of priority three down calls it's not really a thing within our center, at least not right now with our current policies. Um, but we are still actively sending um, the care team and seeing that they are being requested um, for priority one and priority two calls once officers determine that there's no enforcement need. Um, so obviously SPD and SFD um, are handling the higher acuity um, calls. Um, any calls with safety concerns uh, SPD is handling, and obviously any calls with medical concerns, SFD is handling. Um, the care team, just that they're out there, they do have Narcan, so if they ever stumble across an um, overdose or anything, they are able to assist. Um, but right now, uh, what we're telling them is if you do assist, make sure you radio in to get police and uh, medic en route as well um, so that they can offer care. So the community crisis responders, um, currently we have uh, six uh, responders. They work in three teams of two. Um, and again, they are dispatched with SPD. Right now their geographic scope um, is the downtown corridor. Um, so they don't really go north of Denny um, and they go uh, just south, uh, just about the Soto area. Um, they work 11 to 2300, um, so 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Um, and really quick, just to go back to the geographic area, that area is a soft kind of area. They are allowed to go outside that area. Um, so if you have an officer that's outside that area, ask for the care team, they are allowed to say yes, that will respond. Um, it doesn't happen much, um, but they can. Um, and they also will transport outside the area. Um, I know within their first like month, they had to transport somebody to um, down past Tacoma. Um, so they will go out of their way to transport people um, if they need to. Um, again, 
they deal mostly with down subjects and welfare checks. That's the typical rule. But going back to what I was saying earlier, police can request them for other things. If they go out on a disturbance, um, let's say, and it just ends up being someone who needs um, housing assistance or some other assistance and they're not a threat and there's no enforcement action to be taken, police can uh, offer to call the care team to offer any services um, that they can um, or offer snacks, blankets, um, things like that. And then uh, we do have Mark 43, which is the reporting system that SPD uses. Um, Mark 43 is actually gonna be used for the care responders as well. Um, they won't be able to see any of the police side of Mark 43, so they won't be able to see people's criminal history and things like that. Um, but what they'll be able to do is actually put in profiles um, with people's crisis response plans. Um, so maybe add in there that, hey, if you talk about this person's cat, it's going to make them angry. Or if you talk about their cat, they're going to love that. And that's you know how you get them to calm down. Um, all the things that will help them and, uh, you know, kind of uh, assisting uh, a crisis subject. Um, so it's basically they will be building crisis response plans and police will be able to ultimately see those. So if they, ever they interact with a subject that the crisis team has interacted with, they'll be able to kind of see, you know, what their baseline is, what it is that helps calm them down, what may escalate them. Um, so we think that could ultimately help um, because right now, SPD's crisis response team, they do something similar. They put out bulletins with crisis response plans. The issue is their crisis response team is small. And so they can't, you know, interact with a lot of people um, usually. Um, they're oftentimes busy. So we're hoping that with the care team being able to interact with more people in the downtown corridor and hopefully throughout the city as we go forward, um, that we'll be able to build a lot of profiles on a lot of these subjects. Um, to assist with police response and uh, crisis responder response. Excuse me. Currently, the budget, um, piloted budget was $2.4 million. Um, that was for 2024. Um, we also got an additional $2 million additional funding for, um, from participatory budget process to expand. Um, so we are looking at, um, right now in the department, to expand to about 24 responders. Um, so if anybody was worried that we weren't going to expand at all. Um, we are looking at expanding. Uh, Chief Smith has been putting that message out there that, you know, we're only going to be six for so long because we're going to be expanding pretty quickly into this year, um, up to 24 people. Um, and they're already getting prepared with uh, getting the job descriptions revamped um, so that they can get those uh, applications out there for people to apply. Um, and then eventually we'll be building, adding more um, administrative staff on the back end side of the care department as well to assist um, with the expansion and assist, uh, assist with the care team. So the goals obviously of the crisis responders um, is to ultimately free up police officers. I mean, we've all heard it um, over the years that uh, police just doesn't have the capacity to respond to a lot of this stuff. A lot of this stuff, honestly, police shouldn't be responding to. You know, they aren't trained in social work. And quite frankly, I think they agree. This is not their wheelhouse. Um, so it's to free up for police officers. And I know that sounds crazy because we're doing dual dispatch and they still have to go. Um, but there are some caveats in there. Um, so police have the option of responding and having the care team there and then saying, okay, we're good to go. If you, um, if you all feel safe, we can leave, go to respond to the next call. Um, or if the care team doesn't feel safe or the officer thinks that things escalate, they can stick around. Um, the other options uh, though that police have is that if they know a subject, um, so it's somebody who constantly calls 911. They're never a threat. They're never uh, never violent. Um, they don't have any weapons. Um, you know, never pose any sort of threat to anybody. Police can just get on the radio and say, "Hey, we don't need to respond. You can just have the care team respond." So they do have that option, and we're hoping as police get uh, more familiar with a lot of these subjects. Um, that we will see that more often where the care team can just respond in lieu of police and they can just stay free altogether. Um, and I think hopefully at some point we'll look into the care team just responding themselves um, and not having to worry about getting sign off from the police. Um, 
obviously reduce the potentiality uh, for use of force, um, time spent documenting, um, and also potential liability associated. Um, and so that's another thing. Uh, me, as a person of color, I totally get it. Um, being in the 911 field, hearing people call 911 for just a suspicious person standing on the corner, not doing anything. Um, we've all been there in this field where we feel like, why are police responding to this? You know, oftentimes it will lead to something totally escalated for no reason. Um, and so that is another goal is to just re reduce that possibility. Um, obviously increase timeliness for responses to priority three calls. Um, that's still gonna be a touchy one because police is not fully staffed. So again, while they, um, you know, still have to respond, we have to ultimately wait for them to be available before we're able to send the crisis responders. But ideally the goal is to um, increase the timeliness of our responses. Um, again, streamline the process of identifying underlying behavioral health issues and co-facilitating appropriate intervention. Um, again, this goes back to the reporting process that the crisis responders are gonna be um, heavily ingrained in um, is, once they get these profiles on these subjects, they'll be able to, you know, uh, facilitate any type of intervention for them, um, but also just understand what their behavioral health issues are. Um, we won't be doing any type of clinical work. I will put that out there, um, but they will be able to just understand people's baseline and observable actions um, with the subjects that they interact with. And then, obviously improve both uh, short and long-term outcomes. Um, I think this is ultimately for public safety, for police. Um, again, going back to the second point here, reducing some of the use of force um, and increasing timeliness, not even just for priority three calls, but for our priority one and priority two calls for police to be available for these higher priority calls where they're actually needed, um, not for the calls where we can utilize another resource um, in lieu of police. And then uh, we do have an evaluation being designed by Seattle University um, to identify key metrics and leading indicators of success. And, uh, Chief Smith is all about this. Um, again, she's very much a data person. And so she wants to go where the data leads. Um, so having Seattle U create this um, is gonna help us greatly. Um, and also again, as we said, we want 911 to be the main data hub. Um, so understanding um, the stats and data coming out of 911 and the calls for service um, will greatly help us with the path forward. Um, and also developing interagency relationships, um, establishing channels of communication, um, and also integrating our databases. Um, surprisingly, a lot of our databases have not been integrated um, with police, 911, and fire. Um, so that's a lot of the work that we're doing currently um, is meeting with police, meeting with the fire department, figuring out, hey, how can we all communicate with each other? Um, because before, nobody was thinking about the crisis responders utilizing the same reporting system as police. You know, nobody thought it was possible until we realized, oh, we can utilize this reporting system, um, but not allow the crisis responders to see this criminal justice information, just allow them to do what they need to do on their end with behavioral health but and allow police to see that information to better their response to some of these issues. Um, and then also another big thing is our CAD system, which is our computer aided, uh, aided dispatch, excuse me. Um, right now, our CAD system is different than fire. So we really can't communicate with each other. They can't see what's going on. So trying to build up all those things so that our databases are all the same and we're kind of all communicating with each other um, because, you know, we don't do that in city government. We don't communicate with each other for some reason. Um, so we're trying to make that better. Um, currently we have two hybrid vehicles. Um, we have this Suburban and then also a Ford Explorer. Um, we're waiting on a ADA van that's supposed to come uh, first quarter of this year. Um, so hopefully we'll have that soon. Uh, the plan is also to get, uh, so the two vehicles we have right now are temporary. Um, we do have an order in for permanent vehicles that should come sometime later this year. Um, the care responders obviously are on uh, our radio frequencies with police, um, so they can communicate with police. Um, and they do have the radios in the car as well. And then they also have the mobile data terminals, the MDTs in the car, 
um, so that they can see and read the calls that they're responding to um, with police and also mes message them if they need to. Um, they are allowed to, as I said, transport people in these vehicles. We don't have um, the barriers, uh, the partitions that police have in their vehicles. We don't have that because we don't want to be too much like a police car. Um, you know, we want people to feel comfortable. Um, we do just have kind of like a plastic barrier that's able to be moved. Um, but that's just because one of the responders, when they were transporting somebody, they decided to kick their bare feet up in the center console. So they just wanted something there just so people aren't getting too comfortable in the vehicle. Um, but inside the vehicle, they typically have all their supplies, um, snacks, blankets, uh, whatever they might need to uh, help with making somebody feel comfortable or giving them assistance um, they have in the back of their vehicle. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, we are going to get the community violence intervention um, under our department. Um, this is still new. I don't know a ton about it, if I'm being honest, um, because we haven't learned a lot about it yet. Um, but it's going to be the Office of Violence Prevention, uh, which will help unify and align uh, the city investments um, and services for community violence intervention. Um, and I think Sean will probably be working closely with this um, and implementing the multi-pronged set of evidence-based approaches um, to address the community violence, both upstream and downstream, that we're experiencing right now um, in the city. Um, so again, I don't know a ton on this program just yet. Um, because I haven't had a chance to really speak with Amy about it, and I don't think they've made any progress on it yet, but it is supposed to come this year. And that is the PowerPoint that I have. Um, so I am more than happy to take some questions. Rachel, I'll just go ahead and go first, and maybe that will get some folks percolating their own ideas for questions. And I have you... about, I have about 14. So I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so um, questions and you want to type them into the chat. Uh, I will also help to prioritize like in order of when the questions come in, please think about, you can do that too. Uh, sorry to interrupt Carla, but I just want to no, let people could... know. Yeah, definitely. Either raise your hand or, or put them in the chat. We, we will get to all of them. We have plenty of time. So uh, Devante, thank you for your work. This is like my heart issue, huge part of why I choose the candidates that I choose to support. This is a big, big piece of it. And um, one of the questions I had is around, um, you know, is there some reticence within your boss's uh, head, your department, you know, not not the rest of the, the world, the mayor and such. Is there something that is keeping you all from not pushing for more independent care only response? Um, I think one of the big, at least from my thought, thought processes, one of the big bonuses of this is that we can take those officers who are responding to things that they don't need to respond to because it's not their skill set and put them in a better place to respond to a violent call of some other nature. Um, it sounds like everything's very much dual um, dispatch now. Do you think that we might move potentially toward that, um, you know, going, you know, right out of the gate with a care responder instead of a um, police a police person with a, with a badge? Yeah, um, good question. Um, so I think, as of right now, I don't see it happening um, anytime this year. Um, and I say that because uh, Chief Smith is very much uh, data driven. So until the data tells her that we can take that route and there will be no harm to our um, crisis responders, um, I think that's when she'll start to push that. Um, but I think the biggest hindrance is uh, the police guild. Um, and coming from a guild background myself and labor, um, I understand it to an extent, don't get me wrong, I understand it to an extent, um, but that's really the biggest hindrance is that they held all the cards over this last year with, hey, this is our work. So I think the city, and I wasn't involved in these conversations at the time, but I think the city had to find a way to say like, oh, this is still your work, but we just wanna include these other people. And so I think once this pilot continues, 
Um, and we see that, oh, these crisis responders, they're fine. They feel safe on all of these calls. Um, we don't need police to respond because there have never been any instances of them feeling unsafe or getting hurt. Um, I think that's when you'll possibly see us start to um, push for, hey, we can just send the crisis responders alone. Um, and we do have the crisis responders. Um, after each call, they do fill out a survey um, to detail what the call was, what uh, services they offered, um, but also did you feel safe? Um, did police uh, you know, give you all the information you needed? Were police even needed in the first place? Um, so we are gathering that data so that when we do get later further down the line, we can make that argument to say that, hey, we can just utilize the crisis responders. Um, and I do just want to add, you know, um, from our earlier conversation that with this current council, um, while it is a bit more moderate um, than the previous council, um, we are still optimistic as a department. And Chief Smith is very optimistic um, that our department will continue to grow. Um, I think most people in the city will tell you the only department you will probably see grow this year is our department. Um, because they are so focused on investing in this crisis response. Um, and hopefully we can get them to invest in 911 as well, because we're still behind the eight ball on that. But uh, right now they are very focused on the crisis response and we've been hammering it and with the council members that we need to keep this going and we need to get, you know, ideally what Chief Smith will say, we can get a hundred people, still won't solve the issue necessarily, but we'd rather have more people than none. And so that's also where you're seeing us uh, connect with these other services. So the community service officers, the unified care team, um, all these other services that do similar work, we're connecting with them too to understand how can we all work together because there's enough work for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. So we're getting it out there to you know cover all, all of our grounds. Awesome, thank you so much. Thanks for answering two questions there. I do have a third, but I'll defer to the hands raised. Rachel, you wanna uh, moderate uh the hands? Sure, sure thing. Um, uh, I see Chris next. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you. Um, Devante, great pre uh, presentation. I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit more about um, in filling the expanded positions that are coming up, are they looking just for nurses or people with a background in substance use disorder? Or what are they looking for to fill those positions, if you know? So they're looking for um, people, it depends on which position. So let me just uh, break it down. We have our uh, crisis responder one position and crisis responder two. Um, so if you're a crisis responder one, they're looking for somebody with a bachelor's degree and uh, you know something like public health, social work, um, but also somebody with uh, street knowledge as a uh, Amy would say, Chief Smith, um, because she does want people who uh, have that background who are not afraid to go out and speak to people on the street um, who were not just stuck in an office in a controlled environment with people. Um, she wants people with lived experiences. Um, so uh, she definitely takes that into account. Um, but for our community uh, crisis responder two position, uh, that requires a master's uh, degree um, because those uh, crisis responders, they also focus on uh, creating policies um, and developing the care response uh, responder team a little bit more. Um, but again, the lived experiences is something that um, they take into account greatly um, because of the people that we're interacting with uh, typically on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, it doesn't matter which part of public health or social work you come from, um, they'd take anybody as long as they have the experience there. Thank you. Um, how about Michael? I see your hand too. Go ahead, Michael. It's, I have a question of, um, and a funny comment at the end, but the question is really the sort of the getting the data all put together so that in the long run, I mean, this is a, going to be one of your main objectives, I think, over the next year is, is making sure that you have this data that you can then integrate with all the other pieces of data. What's that challenge look like? Did you, was it, was that challenge look like? I'm sorry, it broke up. Yeah, what does that challenge look like? And then the other passing thing so that you can move on to the next person. There's an old movie with Sidney Portain about Seattle. Um, he was answering the phone for people in distress. So you might want to watch that for inspiration. It's an old movie <laughs> like uh, 60s, something like that. So. <laughs> okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, 
So I think the main challenge with getting a lot of this data together um, has been integrating with other departments um, right. and getting some of the data that they have. Um, right now, Chief Smith has done a great job at getting the data from SPD. Um, we're working closely um, with their data analysts um, who's been building different databases um, for you know 911 calls and uh, officers responding to calls. Um, but really, I don't... We have statistics and data within 911. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily the data that Chief Smith is wanting. So I think the data that's coming out of 911 is still yet to be seen um, and still needs to kind of be, uh, there needs to be some sort of prioritization to what data we're looking for out of 911. Um, because again, we just started with the crisis response uh, over the past couple of months. So I don't know if they've really built a mechanism for the 911 side yet. Um, and I'm not too sure if they've been interfacing much with FIRE. Um, considering FIRE has their Health One program and Health 99, um, they're a little bit different um, in this. Um, so we, while we do interact with them um, sometimes when we respond to calls, um, a lot of their data is very specific to medical um, things, so we don't really need theirs. A lot of it is now just integrating um, us with SPD, even though I know we separate it from them, we still need to work together with them um, for our data um, and our stats. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you, to be honest. Um, no, that's okay. My expectation is is that you you know what they have, you don't know what they had they could have that you could yeah. use. And that's the big problem. And then having the two work together in an automated way so that it's easy to get to and and do analysis on. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, yeah, watch the Sydney Port game. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a, another question here. The questions are rolling in. So <laughs> get, get ready. Um, uh, Anne had a question about the ability of the care team to make referrals since you all aren't providing direct clinical care? So the care team, uh, we're getting them the, right now they technically can make uh, referrals to the Crisis Solutions Center um, and for housing. Um, but that's from what we've been getting, the comments we've been getting back from the care team, it depends on who's working. Um, so their manager actually has been working with DESC, with Crisis Solution Center and some of these other outside organizations um, to basically tell them like, hey, we need to allow the care team to make these referrals um, on a consistent basis. Um, so that should hopefully be a thing um, that's coming in the near future. But right now they have been making referrals. It's just been a little spotty because some people will say, well, only SPD can make referrals, but we're like, well, we're trying to change that narrative because we have this team now. Um, so they should be able to make referrals as well. Great. All right. Uh, uh, here's a question from Melvin. How does 911 care in Seattle relate to 911 King County? So you have the overarching King County E911, which runs all the, um, they oversee all the 911 centers in King County. Um, so we interface with them um, on a technology basis um, from that level. Um, but Seattle 911 is separate from King County 911. Um, so King County 911, you'll usually get routed um, to them when you're within their jurisdiction, I would say. Um, it's hard to explain. It's based off of the um, cell towers that you're hitting. Um, so we don't interact with them other than transferring calls to them usually. Um, we're completely separate um, as a 911 agency and the um, stats and data that we're um, using. But they do have uh, monthly King County E911 meetings where all the heads of the 911 centers and the King County area get together and share whatever stats and data that they have. But mainly a lot of it is about the technology for the region. Great. Um, I actually had a question. Um, I wanted to know, so you mentioned that there was this 12 hour period when the teams are currently working now. Mm -hmm. This is from 11 to 2300. Yes. Um, is that, is the reason that it's only those hours because of the, there aren't an, a lot of um, people working those shifts or, I mean, are you just, once you get more people, are you going to get more hours? Because I would think the nighttime 
yes so <laughs> or something. no you're, you're spot on um right now that was chosen strategically one because it's busier times um usually more people are out between the hours of 11 2300 um but also because right now you have the uh, community service officers they start work at i think seven or eight in the morning um and they go until eight at night so uh at the time for this pilot, Chief Smith didn't think we needed anybody from 7 to 11 because you have community service officers that are currently working um, in those early hours. Um, so they identified these hours, but the goal is this year is to eventually expand to 24 hours um, once we get more people. So once we scale up to the 24 that we need, um, we'll probably expand to 24 hours and we'll also probably look to start expanding um, to other parts of the city as well, so not just downtown. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, any, oh, here we go. We've got some more questions here. Um, Michael is asking, uh, what used to be the graveyard shift? Am I am I saying that right, Michael? Yes. What yeah, I used, to, I used to work a graveyard shift and so that's the graveyard shift. So <laughs> that's effectively when it is. And I don't know how it got that called that, but it's sort of the spooky time of day and whatnot. My yeah, dad was, my dad was uh also was in a church that was at second and um James and they did they, he had to serve the neighborhood around there and there was a lot of activity during that period of time. When there was people in need and whatnot, generally that's when it popped up the most. So, yeah, yeah, and the graveyard hours will be probably uh, they'll probably work twenty three hundred to eleven a.m. for yep. graveyard. So yeah, with the twelve hour shifts that they're currently doing. Uh, yep. But yeah, you're right. That is when more people will probably be um, visible on the street and more people are in need around those times, um, especially in the colder and hotter months um, yep. when they need assistance. Oh, Rachel, be... you've got uh, two hands raised. I got you. Um, I uh, am looking at Roxanne. Go ahead. Uh, you have a question. I do. Um, thank you. Uh, Devante, thank you so much for this presentation. It is really good news. Um, have you heard of the Center for Policing Equity? I have not. They've been collecting data on programs like this for about five years. I uh, sent it their uh, information to you in the chat. Awesome, uh, thank you, you. You might find I've spoken with um, the the one of the two heads of the organization, mm -hmm. and uh, they're doing incredible work across the nation. Um, they did have a short relationship with the Seattle Police Department, but they have massive amounts of data that um, might be supportive for what you're looking into, and. Um, Yes, thank you. And then um, last question for me is, as an organization, is there anything that we can do um, to support you? Yeah, I mean, besides the obvious of supporting the care responders, I think that's the biggest thing um, is continuing to basically let everyone know why this is so important um, to have crisis responders, um, to have this alternative response aside from just police or fire. Um, but the other message that is big for me is getting out that we need more 911 personnel. Um, we can have, you know, a thousand police officers, a thousand crisis responders, but without 911 personnel to answer the phones or to dispatch these people, we don't have anything. Um, and so Seattle has never really done a great job at uh, building up 911. Um, right now we're behind the eight ball, probably by 50, 60 people that we probably should need um, to be considered uh, staffed appropriately. Um, so really that's kind of the biggest advocacy for me is pushing out that we need more. Um, we need to expand our 911 center. Um, one, so that we can better serve the public, honestly. Um, we have a, a question from Julie. Go ahead, Julie, with your question, please. Oh, hi. And um, I agree with uh, the last speaker that this program is really, really good. And you've given us lots of information, very informative. Um, I, my question is, is this program, if you want to call it that, available in other areas outside Seattle, like north, south, the uh, west side, Port Orchard, um, any other areas? 
So um, I'm not familiar with any that are in Washington. Um, we've been going to other states um, to view their programs, uh, namely Durham, North Carolina. They have a program similar. Um, they were there last year to uh, view their program. We're going back in uh, March um, to get more exposure, um, but then also Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, those are the two kind of uh, cities that we've been looking at. Uh, Denver is also one that they traveled to um, that they kind of used as a model, um, but mainly Durham and Albuquerque. I'm not familiar with any other um, cities within Washington that has done anything like this. And um, I will go further to say that we are extremely unique in the fact that we created this third public safety agency um, that's not really seen anywhere else in the country. Um, so Seattle is leading the way and saying that, hey, this is another public safety agency. You don't just have police and fire. You also have this public safety agency that deals with diversified response and also 911. Yes, well, um, I'm asked because my son is a dispatcher in Port Orchard and from what little he can tell me, they could definitely use this a uh, care team out there. Oh, I would bet they can use it all over if I'm being all honest. Over I, I would, yeah. I would, I would, many cities would honestly get on board with this and see how beneficial it is. I mean, again, just in the short period of time since October, um, honestly, officers have been excited to have the care responders. You know, they even try to ask for them outside of their hours. Um, so, you know, we've seen just a lot of positivity. We've actually had people just on the street asking for care responders. Um, the other day I had, um, a lady stop by our office. Hey, is this a care responder office? Um, because we have people up the street under the bridge that they've been asking for blankets. So people know that we're there, um, and they're actively seeking it out. And so it's been amazing. So would you have any idea about how to go about getting this implemented in other areas? <sighs> that's oh. a hard one. <laughs> Let's, uh, uh, I, I, maybe that's something we could take offline. I don't know, maybe we could get uh, Julie connected with you to get a name or something yeah, and I we would, could uh, share. I would just throw out there really quick um, that Chief Smith is her focus this year. Um, they want her to start taking this to the state and national level. Um, to start kind of advocating for this um, across our, all areas. Thank you. Um, Rachel, we, Rachel, just a quick time check. We've got about 10 minutes and I know Elizabeth Heath has had her I'm, I'm uh, question in the chat. I got you, I got you. Elizabeth, you have a question, go ahead. And you're on mute, Elizabeth. You're still on mute, Elizabeth. I was having trouble accessing the um, the 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 button to push to get on. I have my question. I've been trying to get through. I've been sending <laughs> chats to various people, but uh, here I am. Would you please explain the priority call number system? You refer to one, two, three, four, I think, and I don't know what they are. And then um, the second question you answered. Uh, the third question was you mentioned innovation. Uh, from contact with care programs in other areas that was in your PowerPoint uh, presentation. And I'm curious about what kind of innovation has happened or do you anticipate, what, do, what, do you, what would you call innovation? You know, what, what is that about? So those are my two questions, thanks. Yeah, so um, really quick, the priority system um, is, and this is kind of like a summary, I'm not giving the exact um, language that's in our policy, but basically a priority one type code um, is imminent uh, threat to life. Um, so an active emergency where somebody's life is in danger, um, that is a priority one. Um, a priority two is uh, anything that could uh, potentially escalate um, to lead, it's an active disturbance or active event ongoing um, that could potentially escalate um, to be an imminent threat to life. Um, and then a priority three, that is more of just kind of like a report, um, report, no threat to life. Um, those are usually your welfare checks, um, assist the public calls, 
um, calls where there's really no crime in progress. Something happened, you know, either a few hours ago or a few days ago, a couple weeks ago, um, and the suspect is not there. Um, so priority two and priority one is typically suspect on scene or just left the area. Um, but priority one has that extra element of there's a threat to uh, imminent threat to life at that moment. Um, as far as innovation, um, if I'm being honest, I can't really speak much to that um, because I haven't really seen it yet. Um, again, since we're still so in the early stages of it, um, I don't know what that looks like. I think really the biggest innovation that's being pushed right now um, is the fact that we are this third public safety department that are that is consolidating um, all of these different resources into this department to basically be one um, large resource um, to assist. Um, and it'll make better use, um, I think, of public funds to just have all the resources under one department instead of divvied out all over. Um, I would So I would say that's the biggest innovation right now. Um, I think we're still trying to figure out how we can take this further. Um, I think the next step will just be, hey, we want these uh, responders to respond alone and not necessarily have police. Um, that in and of itself, honestly, is innovation. Um, you know, I know it sounds terrible um, since, you know, we should have been here by now, um, but um, that will be innovative of itself. But um, I think the other thing I would mention is 911 being the main data hub and being so data driven. I don't think anybody's ever really thought of 911 as being a data hub. Only The only reason they would think of it being a data hub is for their staffing, is for overtime, mandatory overtime, right? Mm -hmm. They never thought about it for public safety. Um, and how we utilize these stats um, to push our message about, uh, the, you know, the need for more crisis responders based off of the number of crisis calls that we're receiving, nonviolent calls that officers are responding to. Um, so those are just kind of the things off the top of my head that I would think of as far as innovation. Um, as far as anything else, I can't really say, honestly, at this moment. No, this has been great. Uh, what about uh, state funds? State funds, um, I don't know what state funds we've received. I know most of our funds we've received have been in the form of grants. Um, the manager for the care response, um, she's been working with our director of finance um, to do a lot of grant writing. Um, so that's where a lot of our money has been coming from. And I think a lot of it's been coming from uh, the federal level mm -hmm. um, and maybe some of it from the state level as well. Okay, thank you very much. Good presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, De Devante, we've got uh, one other question that I can see here that I just want to be sure we we mm -hmm. cover before you have to go. Um, what would be the, uh, this is from Graham, by the way, what would be the additional budget for 50 to 60 people? Do, is there a way that that you know, like the dollar amount or what that what that would be? Oh, I would have to go back and try to find this um because we did a uh statement of legislative intent this past summer um basically giving the council all this information letting them know we needed you know ideally to get up to our ideal staffing numbers this is how many people we need this is how much it would cost excuse me i don't know it off the top of my head so i would have to look for that dig through my email to find that but i can definitely um email it to you, Rachel, when I find it, um, and then you can get it to them. Sure will. Sure will okay. do that. I, I do have a, a follow-up on an earlier question mm -hmm. uh, that I hope we might be able to cover also before the end of the program, and that is um, the uh, fact that you need more people. And so is there an active recruiting process going on? Is there a way that we can get the word out to folks that might fit the criteria that you were talking about who would be good, you know, good fits for these, these jobs? Yeah, so we, um, we're kind of always hiring. Um, if you go to the City of Seattle Jobs website, you'll see usually the first link there um, is 911 uh, Dispatcher. Um, and so, uh, we're typically going out to career fairs. Um, I just started reaching out to uh, the school districts because we're one of the few agencies that hire people at the age of 18. Um, and so I've been thinking for students who may not want to go to college, but still want a decent job. 
hey, 911 pay is great. I mean, we start right now with $31 an hour, and that's actually about to increase once they get their pay raises. Um, and so it's a great job for somebody who's 18, 19, just getting out of high school and may not want to go to college and, you know, want to figure out their life. Um, so we we're reaching out to them to go to, you know, the high schools. We've been going to college uh, job fairs um, and also going down to JBLM um, to talk to um, active military as well. Um, because we find a lot of them like to apply sometimes to different public safety agencies. Um, or but would they retire because a lot of yes. military retire a full 20 year uh, career yeah. by, by the time they're 38. And yeah. So yeah. They, they're young. Right. And it's, it's a difficult thing to say what, what's driving people out. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just the stress of the job. The fact that it's shift work, um, and you know, you spend more time at work than you do with your family. Um, and then you have mandatory overtime. So there's a lot that goes into why a lot of people have been uh, leaving, but we're trying to change that, uh, eliminate overtime and just make the culture better, um, to hopefully keep people around. But, um, we're definitely actively pursuing, um, people and we typically have a decent number of applicants, um, any given time. Great. Great. All right, I think uh, I think we have covered all the questions for today. So uh, let me just take this last moment to thank you so much for being with us one more time. And um, if everyone, again, let's just wave wave our hands in the air. That's all we can do on a Zoom box. But thanks again so much for being with us and sharing your time. And of course, know. I appreciate it. And I um, just want to let you know if. Uh, you would like me to come back either uh, in the middle of the year, at the end of the year to give an update. I'd be more than happy to, um, because again, I'm sure things will be rapidly changing this year and um, we'll hopefully be adding those additional positions and kind of expanding more and we'll have more information for you guys. That's great. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Devante. What a, what